I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spin Up ahead the road is thin Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. Here is something that travelers learn right away. Things are seldom what they seem at first glance. Really, you have to look twice. This, for instance, might seem at first to be just another handsome horse. Oh no, not just another, the only, the last of all the offspring in this wide world of the greatest horse of all time. Secretariat by 12, Secretariat by 14 lengths on the turn. And this, of course, is a gas station, except it isn't. Back when the gas seemed to be giving out, a lot of the gas stations of America gave up the ghost and were reincarnated as something else again. And this is, well, ice. There's nothing special about ice. There's something special about this ice, though. It is made by the Ice Meister and is therefore the most pampered, perfect ice any Olympian could ever want. You have to look twice, as we've been saying. If you're ready to do that, to look again and to listen again, too, come and meet the king of the cowbells. Well, that was a pretty good bell, a high note, and, and it's uh, it, it's pretty well sustained note. It's got a pretty good ring. Jim Whitney yeah. sits on the steps of his front porch in Nashua, New Hampshire, and contemplates the musical qualities of cowbells. That isn't too bad a bell. He loves cowbells. He has cleaned out the cowbell inventory of every flea market for 100 miles around. He has bought cowbells sight unseen from as far away as Wyoming after having them rung to him over the telephone. In his crowded living room, he's assembled two octaves of cowbells, and he's still searching for the perfect one, the Miracle Bell. The bells of St. Mary's, oh, about Jim Whitney's getup, most of his life he was a sober, respectable manufacturer of concrete blocks. But he never quite got over a summer he spent 60 years ago traveling the country with Gus Hill's minstrel show and doing walk-ons in burlesque. Now 83 years old and with all those concrete blocks behind him, Jim Whitney couldn't think of anything better to do than to start looking for cowbells and revive his old career. <laughs> Are you sure this is a, a, a dignified uh, thing for a man your age to be doing? Well, uh, that's debatable. And I'm afraid I'd lose a debate, you know. <laughs> and when I grow to... When he plays the church suppers and county fairs, he calls himself the great Dr. Casey. He didn't even have to think up new jokes. He remembers all the 60-year-old ones. What's that, madam? You say you have too much iron in the blood? Well, you eat a lot of pork? Well, that's probably pig iron. Anybody? Yes, right over there. What's that? How do you prevent infections caused by biting insects? Why, sure, don't bite any insects. Now, you know, if you want to find the lake, you go up Lake Street. If you want to find the bridge, you go up Bridge Street. If you want to find the church, you go up Church Street. So I hang around on Broad Street. <laughs> of course, I don't have to do this for a living. You see, when I was a young fella, I thought I'd like to be a meat cutter. But I backed up into the Hamburg machine, and I got a little behind in my work. <laughs> Jim Whitney is searching for the perfect cowbell, and in the meantime, making do with the ones he has. 
Somewhere in the world, he says, there's an F-sharp cowbell better than his, but he hasn't heard it yet. Somewhere in the world, there may be an 83-year-old having more fun than he is, but I haven't met him yet. Thank you very much, folks. Well, that's all right, folks. I, uh, thank you very much. Just after dawn this morning, he was there, taking the temperature of the ice. In every dawn and every dusk and late into the night, he is there, building the ice up, shaving it down, smoothing it, coddling it, cursing it. In rain and snow and sun and shadow, he is there, caring for the ice as a lover cares for his true love. Who is this man? Ask American speed skater Maura D'Andrea. I don't know his name, but I know him as the Ice Meister. Correct. He is Ernst Eidloff, the Ice Meister of Insel. There's Ice Meisters all over the world that people are making ice at ice rinks, but if you say the Ice Meister, they know you're talking about Ernst in Insel. For the duration, he is Ernst in Alberville, having been summoned from Insel in the Bavarian Alps to test his reputation in weather that is too wet and too warm, with ice that is too impure, on a track that was built on sand. It sounds very difficult. Why, <laughs> why did you take this job? Well, I didn't know what I was getting into, he says. In fact, I thought about quitting the job once, but the athletes came and asked me to continue. Of course they asked him to continue. He is an alchemist. Alone in the world, Ernst Eibloff knows how to turn ice into glass. Ora D'Andrea. Good ice is when you can, it's like a, a mirror. You can see your image in it perfectly. Michelle Klein. Great ice is when you can push and you glide. You go, the ice shines, it sparkles. Coach Peter Miller. It's a real science, a real art, and he's just the best in the world. A giant compressor with a hellish roar a delicate thermometer which registers fractions of a degree centigrade. Hydrometers, barometers, and assorted ingenious sprayers and razors and brushes. These are the tools of the Ice Meister's trade. And his goal is nothing less than glassy, glittering perfection. Every so often, as today, the skaters come along and leave Ernst Eidloth's perfect creation all scratched up. And 13 more races are scheduled here. Never fear. The Iceman cometh. Life in America keeps getting more confusing in ways nobody could have foreseen. Out here on the road, things are no longer always as they appear to be. Take this gas station over here on the corner, for example. Anybody can tell that's a gas station. You can tell that's a gas station from a block away. The only thing is, it isn't a gas station. It's a bakery. You have to read the fine print at gas stations these days to discover whether they sell gas. This one in St. Petersburg, Florida, doesn't sell gas. In a fine irony of the energy crisis, it sells bicycles. The gas station across the street doesn't sell gas either. It's about to become a food store. And the one on the next corner doesn't either. It rents trailers. 10,000 gas stations went out of business last year alone. What makes it tricky for the traveler is that by now, many of them have entered their second incarnation. I mean, we found a station in Tifton, Georgia that was open all right, but not for filling gas tanks. It was open for vaccinating beagles, and we don't have a beagle. These are still service stations, it's just that their services are different now. The energy crisis has suddenly offered thousands of small businessmen a bonanza in empty buildings, ready for occupancy, in strategic locations, complete with restrooms, and with plenty of free parking for the customers. Charlie Bell, who sells everything from groceries to fishing poles, says his business has never been better since Standard Oil moved out and he moved in. So a situation which has been calamitous for many gasoline dealers 
has worked out fine for, say, dealers in sofas and chairs. For the public, as I say, old habits can be hard to break. You think you've found a gas station, and all you've found is a chiropractor. The trouble is the old familiar profiles of the gas station, which we all learned to recognize in those halcyon years when gas stations sold gas. The puzzled archaeologist of the future will probably wonder why we built so many buildings of that style and regard them all as old curiosity shops. In the meantime, Bill of Bill's Welding Boats and Campers in Florida has made a sign that saves himself some trouble and points the way to the future. Sorry, his gas station sign reads, this is not a gas station. First time in the hall, Carl. This is a pretty nice big foal. A rite of spring in the Kentucky horse country, the birth of a thoroughbred. First time outside. This one is barely 12 hours old. At Stone Farm, the winner of two Kentucky Derbies, Arthur B. Hancock III, is looking the youngster over. Well, you look for, for soundness, for good straight legs. You look for balance, and you look for good muscles. And uh, I like myself a good attitude. <laughs> In the fields, Hancock's yearlings, last year's newborn, gallop and grow toward adulthood. It's hard to tell who's really got the courage. I mean, nobody can tell you who's going to be a good horse. But uh, you can narrow the odds, you know, through experience. Last year's yearlings, this year's two-year-olds, are on the training track, finally finding out what they were bred for. The apple of Arthur Hancock's eye this spring is an unraced daughter of Secretariat. She's very proud looking, isn't she? See how she walks with a sort of a wiggle? That's a real good sign in a horse. Her name is Risen Starlet. She has the distinction of being the very last of Secretariat 661 offspring. She's the last Secretariat foal born on Earth. As a yearling, she wasn't anything to look at. As a yearling, she was crooked and not really correct. Sort of an ugly duckling. And now she's kind of blossoming out. And the balance, she's sort of balanced. Don't you think like Secretary? You give her another couple of months, she's going to look like her daddy. And oh, what a horse her daddy was. Woody, he looks like a million, doesn't he? He does look like a million, but unfortunately in this next story... There was that kind of electric feeling that draws crowds. They knew that they were going to see greatness. Rounded rear end you see facing you is Secretariat. Well, facing me... Haywood Hale Bruin covered the Belmont Stakes for CBS in 1973. That was the day Secretariat won the Triple Crown. As a field, they all look wonderful, but you do have to say that Secretariat at this moment looks a little more wonderful. With he came into this circle, pranced around. You remember, he was a very handsome chestnut with a deep chest and was considered by connoisseurs of the horse to be perfect in his measurements. There was an excitement before he even ran. And uh, let me just ask you, Mrs. Tweedy, for a finish. You are confident, I'm sure. No, I'm scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> then there was so much pressure. First time in 25 years to win the Triple Crown, to win the Belmont. Penny Chenery Tweedy was Secretariat's owner. We were on the cover of three national magazines, and this is the kiss of death for Secretariat to be on the cover of Time. We thought, oh, he'll never, never overcome this. They're moving on the turn now. For the turn at Secretariat, it looks like he's opening. The lead is increasing. Make it three, three and a half. He's moving into the turn. Secretariat overcame the cover story jinx with the greatest performance a thoroughbred has ever given. Secretariat is widening now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Secretariat by 12. Secretariat by 14 lengths on the turn. 
secretary it was all alone and he became more and more all alone as he made that great run down the stretch. He's out there almost a sixteenth of a mile away from the rest of the horses. He was running through the fire in his blood that made him think that even though he had no wings, if he went fast enough, he could fly up and join the horses in the sky. He's into the stretch. Secretary leads his field by 18 lengths. I was in awe. It was the day he felt best in his life, and he was in the most important race of his life, which is the way extraordinary events happened. He is going to be the triple crown winner. Here comes Secretary to the wire. An unbelievable, an amazing performance. He hits the finish 25 lengths in front. I still can't put in words how I felt because I was so scared we weren't going to do it that I think I still haven't gotten used to the fact that we did. <laughs> An amazing, unbelievable performance by this miracle horse. And look at Mrs. Sweetie. She's having the time of her life. She and Lucia... I got goosebumps all over me. and Just sat there on the couch and tears, you know, welled up in your eyes and goosebumps come. And um, I get them right now thinking about it. Is that perfection? Unbelievable is all you're hearing down perfection. here. Perfection. Even after he points. stopped racing, the big red stallion remained the image of perfection. Nobody who ever saw him will ever forget him. One of the reasons he became so beloved is that he didn't just go to pasture and sit there. He said, come see me. I'll give you a show. I <laughs> For 16 seasons, Secretariat stood at stud in his own private paddock at Claiborne Farm in Paris, Kentucky, a home of champions. He was the star of the place. People came from all over just to see him, as Haywood Hill Brun remembers. We went down to see him with our cameras, and he was alone in a field early in the morning, and there were red leaves and white snow on the ground, and this big red horse moved across the field in an extended trot. And watching him move, you realized that he loved moving, that there was something in him that just made the motion of his body exhilarating to him. He seemed to know that he was something special. And you had only, as visitors did to the farm, you had only to produce the cheapest of little cameras. And his head went up and his nostrils flared. He loved to have his picture taken. He was a kind of Al Jolson of horses, if you will, who loved being in the spotlight. I still get mail from people who tell me how they felt on Belmont Day, or how, how they felt when the horse died. Uh, he's not forgotten. Secretariat is buried near Bold Ruler and Buck Passer in a horse graveyard. Not far from the stall where he held forth for so many years, not far from Arthur Hancock's place, where the last of the great horses foals, Risen Starlet, is going to school. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is her first time in the starting gate. Sometimes they won't go through. And if you try to push them through, they can throw a fit. You just have to go very easy with them. That's a good girl. That's a good girl. See? See, that's not going to hurt you. Come on. Come on out. Okay, good job. And what if Risen Starlet, the absolute last secretariat foal, really did grow up to become the image of her father? A truly great horse. That would, that would be another goose bumper. Secretariat is widening now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Secretariat by 12. Secretariat by 14 lengths on the turn. Secretariat has opened a 22 length lead. He is going to be the triple crown winner. Here comes Secretariat to the wire. An unbelievable, an amazing performance. Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. 
I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years I've been a wonder Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around the bend 